We're now going to turn to First Minister's questions. Uh, before we take questions, I believe the First Minister would like to update Parliament with a short statement. First Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, thank you. I do want to update the Chamber on the current position in relation to COVID. And I must stress at the outset that the situation we face in relation to the virus remains very precarious and extremely serious. Therefore, in order to maximise our chances of effectively suppressing the virus, I will set out today some further tightening of the lockdown restrictions. Uh, firstly, though, I'll give a brief summary of today's statistics. The total number of positive cases reported yesterday was 1,949. That represents 10.2 of all tests carried out and takes the total number of cases now to 155,372. I can also confirm that as of yesterday, 191,965 people had received their first dose of vaccine. 1,794 people are now in hospital with COVID, which is 77 more than yesterday. And I can tell the Chamber that 1,005 patients were admitted to hospital in the week up to 7th January alone, and that compares to 851 in the last week of December. Uh, 134 people are currently in intensive care, which is one more than yesterday. Um, all of these figures, of course, underline the severity of the pressure on the National Health Service and the fact that it is increasing. I'm also very sad to report that in the past 24 hours, a further 79 deaths have been registered of patients who first tested positive in the previous 28 days. And the total number of deaths under that measurement is now 5,102. National Records of Scotland has also just published its weekly update. Uh, this includes cases where COVID is a suspected or contributory cause of death, even if it has not been confirmed through a test. Today's update shows that by Sunday, the total number of registered deaths linked to COVID under the wider definition was 7,074. 384 of those deaths were registered last week, and that is 197 more than in the previous week, and it is indeed the highest weekly figure we have uh, recorded since May. Some of the increase last week, of course, may be down to people registering deaths uh, last week that had occurred over the Christmas and New Year period. But even so, this figure is heartbreakingly high and it reminds us again of the grief that this virus continues to cause. And yet again, I send my condolences to all those who have lost a loved one. Uh, Presiding officer, just uh, a little while ago, the Cabinet Secretary for Health made a detailed statement about our vaccination programme. As I give today's statement, which will inevitably focus on the sacrifices we are asking of people, it is worth highlighting some of the key points that she made. We have already vaccinated more than 80% of care home residents in Scotland and more than half of frontline health and social care workers. The vaccination of those over the age of 80 is underway and gathering speed. First doses for the over 80s will be completed by uh, the start of February and everyone aged over 70 uh, will have been offered vaccination by mid-February. It is our aim to vaccinate everyone over 65 and also those with extreme clinical vulnerability by the end of February. Uh, this means that by the start of March, 1.4 million people will have received at least the first dose of the vaccine. To support this, more than 1,100 vaccination centres are already operational. That number will increase with mass centres opening too as supplies increase. All of this is positive. Vaccination offers us a route back to a more normal life and does give us real hope for the future. But for now, of course, we are in a race against the virus. To win the race, we must complete the vaccination programme as quickly as possible, and that is what we will do. But we must also slow down the virus. Today's numbers demonstrate again why that is so necessary. In early December, we were recording approximately 100 new cases of COVID every week for every 100,000 people. That figure since then has almost trebled. And that's, of course, mainly because the new variant, which is much easier to transmit, is spreading rapidly. The new variant now makes up around 60% of new cases and is making it far more difficult to get the R number back below one without severe restrictions. Of course, we now have severe restrictions in place, and while it is still very early days, there are some signs that lockdown may be starting to have an effect. The rapid increase in cases that we saw around the turn of the year appears to have slowed down and begun to stabilise. That is good news, but at this stage, it can give us no room for complacency. It is still too soon to be entirely confident that the situation is stabilising. And of course, even if it is, this will only be because of lockdown. It is not, unfortunately, an indication that it is safe to ease it yet in any way. 
The number of new cases is still far too high and of course all of this is having a significant and severe impact on our health service. With the number of people being infected every day remaining as high as it is, the pressure on the NHS is likely to increase further and continue for some time. And of course, as I reported a few moments ago last week, saw the highest number of registered deaths from COVID since early May. So we must continue to do everything possible to reduce case numbers. This is essential to relieve the pressure on the NHS, but also to save lives. That is why the Cabinet considered yesterday some further tightening of the lockdown restrictions to ensure that they can be as effective as they need to be in suppressing the virus. There are six changes that we intend to make and the regulations giving effect to these will, subject to Parliament's approval, take effect on Saturday. Now, I am aware that some of these changes will sound technical and relatively minor. However, we believe that both individually and collectively, these additional measures in further reducing the interactions that allow the virus to spread will help our essential efforts to suppress it. And of course, however technical the changes might sound, I know that all of them involve further restrictions on our essential liberties. So I want to give an assurance again that none of these decisions are arrived at lightly. Let me therefore set out now what these changes are. Uh, firstly, we intend to limit the availability and operation of click and collect retail services. Only retailers selling essential items will be allowed to offer click and collect. This will include, for example, clothes and footwear, footwear baby equipment, homeware and books. All other click and collect services must stop. More importantly, though, for click and collect services that are allowed, staggered appointments will need to be offered to avoid any potential for queuing and access inside premises for collection it will not be permitted. Uh, the details will be set down in regulations and in guidance. I know that businesses affected by this change will be disappointed and that many have gone to great lengths to make services as safe as possible. But we must reduce as far as is possible the reasons people have right now for leaving home and coming into contact with others. I welcome the actions of those businesses that have voluntarily suspended click and collect and tightened their procedures in, for example, relation to face coverings. Secondly, we intend to apply restrictions to takeaway services. Customers will no longer be permitted to go inside to collect takeaway food or coffee. Any outlet wishing to offer takeaway will have to do so from a serving hatch or doorway. This is to reduce the risk of customers coming into contact indoors with each other or with staff. Thirdly, we intend to change the rules around consumption of alcohol. Um, at the moment, different parts of Scotland have different laws in relation to the consumption of alcohol in outdoor public places. However, from Saturday, it will be against the law in all level four areas uh, for, uh, to drink alcohol outdoors in public. Uh, that will mean, for example, that buying a takeaway pint and drinking it outdoors will not be permitted. Again, I know this is not a popular move, but it is intended to underline and support the fact that we should only be leaving home right now for essential purposes. That includes exercise or recreation, but it does not include simple socialising. And when you do leave home, you should only meet one person from another household in a group no bigger than two people. I know this is a hard message and it is absolutely not one that I want to be sending, but it is vital to reduce the risk of the virus spreading. Fourthly, and significantly, we intend to strengthen the obligation on employers to allow their staff to work from home whenever possible. Uh, the law already says that we should only be leaving home to go to work if it is work that cannot be done from home. This is a legal obligation that falls on individuals. However, we will now introduce statutory guidance to make clear uh, uh, to employers uh, that they must support their workers to work from home wherever possible. For all employers, the basic but vital message is this. If your staff were working from home during the first lockdown last year, they should be working from home now and you should be facilitating that. Uh, fifthly, we will strengthen the provisions in relation to work inside people's houses. We've already issued guidance to the effect that in level four areas, work is only permitted within a private dwelling if it is essential for the upkeep, maintenance and functioning of the household. And we will now put this guidance into law. Now, the final change is an amendment to the regulations requiring people to stay at home. But uh, I want to be clear, this is intended to close an apparent loophole rather than change the spirit of the law. It will also bring the wording of the stay-at-home regulations in Scotland into line with the other UK nations. 
Right now, the law states that people can only leave home for an essential purpose. However, having left home for an essential purpose, someone could then stay out of their home to do something that is not essential without breaching the law as it stands. So the amendment will make it clear that people must not leave or remain outside the home unless for an essential purpose. This change will provide legal clarity to facilitate any necessary enforcement. But I want to be clear that it doesn't change the range of essential purposes that currently enable people to leave their house, nor does it, for example, put any time limit on how long you can be outdoors for essential exercise. But it does mean that if the police challenge you for being out of the house doing something that is not essential, it will not be a defence to say that you initially left to do something that was. Presiding officer, I know that none of this makes for enjoyable listening. If it's any comfort, though, I don't expect it will be. It gives me no pleasure to be talking about further restrictions on businesses and on our individual freedoms to come and go as we please. But please know that we would not be doing any of this if we did not believe it essential to get and keep this potentially deadly virus under control. Case numbers are still so high and the new variant is so infectious that we must uh, be as tough and as effective as we possibly can be to stop it spreading. That does mean taking further steps to stop people from meeting and interacting indoors and also outdoors. Today's measures will help us to achieve that. They are a regrettable but necessary means to an end. In concluding, I want to stress again that though these are dark and difficult times, we also have grounds for hope. As I indicated earlier, there are some early signs that the lockdown is beginning to have an effect, so we must stick with it. In addition, vaccination is already protecting a lot of the people who are most vulnerable to the virus, and it will protect many more in the weeks and months ahead. And finally, however hopeless this situation makes all of us feel at times, the fact is none of us are powerless in the face of this virus. We can't guarantee we won't get it or pass it on. It is, after all, highly infectious but we can all behave in a way that significantly reduces our risk of getting it or passing it on. So please continue to do that. And I want to stress this point, please stick to the spirit and not just to the letter of these rules. Don't think in terms of the maximum interactions you can have without breaking the rules. Please think instead about how you minimize your interactions to the bare essentials to remove as many opportunities as possible for the virus to spread. And in everything you do, assume that the virus is there with you, that either you have it or any person you're in contact with has it, and act then in a way that prevents it passing between you. All of this means staying at home, except for genuinely essential purposes, and that includes working from home whenever possible. Except for essential purposes, do not have people from other households in your house and do not go into theirs. And please follow the facts advice at all times when you are out and about. All of this is how we keep ourselves and our loved ones safe and it is how we keep the virus under control until the vaccines get to do their work. So at this critical and dangerous moment, please stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, First Minister. First Minister will now take questions. I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons and I call Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the First Minister for advance notice of her statement. The announcement of new restrictions today to both take away and click and collect services, while understandable, will be a further disappointment to businesses. Business groups have said that the evidence for this decision has not yet been made plain to them, and for many, these restrictions were unexpected only a week ago. They thought that their services would continue, and in many cases, had invested heavily to make their premises safe to keep trading. I'm pleased that the First Minister says there will be funding made available at some point, but is there not a case for extra compensation for businesses who were told by this government what to do to become COVID compliant, spent money making all of the changes that ministers required of them, and are now being told that they have to adapt again? First Minister. Um, these are all reasonable points. On the question of evidence, we will publish uh, probably just about now um, an evidence paper, uh, an update of the one we published last week to put uh, into the public domain for scrutiny by members of parliament and also by the wider public. Uh, 
the, the state of the epidemic, uh, the evidence underpinning the decisions we are making. Um, I fully understand uh, the, the call for businesses in different sectors for specific evidence about transmission in their sectors. And uh, when we were at a stage with community prevalence of the virus lower, that was much more relevant to look uh, with a laser focus at exactly where the virus was spreading. When we have higher community transmission being fuelled by this faster spreading variant, um, it is much more a case that what the evidence tells us is that overall, in general, we have to minimise all of the interactions between uh, ourselves and each other. Now, lockdown, as was announced last week, uh, has, I think, substantially done that. And uh, we have data uh, that suggests that uh, traffic volumes have fallen, that people's contacts have fallen. But we do know, anecdotally, as well as uh, from uh, other uh, areas that there are some uh, parts of the economy and some aspects of individual behaviour where understandably uh, people are still coming together in a way against a faster transmitting variant of the virus, risks continued spread and that's why we set out these further tightenings today. In Click and Collect, for example, I know many businesses have already decided voluntarily to suspend. Uh, we are not taking away it altogether, but we are uh, putting in place more mitigations and greater restrictions, all for the end of suppressing the virus. Uh, on, finally, Presiding Officer, um, on the issue of financial compensation, there is significant money uh, available, much of it already with businesses, much more of it flowing to businesses over the course of this month. And, uh, the Finance Secretary recently set out additional payments for those in the hospitality and retail sectors, uh, for example. We will continue to look on an ongoing basis at what, within our resources, we can do and where uh, there are legitimate calls for uh, more financial support. But I hope businesses, however difficult this is, will understand, as individuals do, that all of this is simply necessary and inescapable right now if we are not to see ourselves and our National Health Service overwhelmed by this virus and, unfortunately, many more people dying from it. Ruth Davison. Thank you. This decision is the latest where businesses don't feel involved or consulted by the government. They feel like an afterthought and no wonder. We called for a business, a COVID business council months ago. The First Minister said she'd take it forward, but it's still not been launched. The new funding announced earlier this week is welcome, but it was welcome way back on the 9th of December too, when the government announced an extra 185 million of support for business and 55 million funding for sports clubs. And in November, when they announced the Strategic Framework Support Fund. And it was welcome in late October, when they announced a 30 million pound discretionary fund. Of all of those funds, we've seen only evidence of 6 million reaching businesses. Will the First Minister agree to immediately publish how much of all of that funding has actually reached businesses? And will she tell us just now, has even a tenth of all of that funding been delivered months on? First Minister. Uh, we will publish figures as that information comes through. Local authorities are uh, in the main administering this funding. But if you take the uh, £715 million pounds that has been allocated to business support since uh, October, uh, £600 million of that is already live. The vast majority of other funds go live uh, this month. Uh, payments are flowing to businesses and uh, at the end of this month, the businesses that are eligible for the uh, additional top-up payments uh, will receive uh, those payments. But we will continue to publish uh, figures as we uh, proceed. Um, on consultation with businesses, we discussed with businesses on an ongoing basis, uh, with business organisations, with individual sectors. And I appreciate uh, the desire for uh, as much consultation as possible and we will try to do that uh, as far as we possibly can but ultimately right now uh, we face decisions that are inescapable no amount of discussion and consultation takes us away from the sharp point that we have a rapidly spreading virus that if we don't reduce and minimize interactions will overwhelm us overwhelm our National Health Service and lead to the deaths of many more people than would otherwise be the case. Um, so I'm afraid that is the harsh reality of the situation we're in just now. And my duty as First Minister and the duty of the government is not to shy away from these difficult decisions, to, to take the responsibility for these decisions, to stand up here, to set them out, to set out the reasons for them and the evidence behind them. And yes, do as much as we can, as we will continue to do, to support those affected by them. Ruth Davison responsibility not to let viable businesses fall. And here's where we're at. Leaked documents show that only seven in 30 business funds have launched. The FSB Scotland says that funding is trapped in an administrative logjam. Another fund that's not included in that list of 30 has opened. The Digital Boost Development Grant launched yesterday morning. 
It was meant to remain open for six weeks, but it has already shut within 24 hours because it was inundated and oversubscribed. That is the measure of how desperate things are. Businesses are crying out for funding, but the funds aren't opening and the guidance hasn't been delivered. The First Minister just talked about councils. Well, councils want to get it out the door, but they're hearing nothing from the Scottish Government. If you click onto the Falkirk Council website, they list 16 Scottish Government funds and then underneath they say, and I will quote it directly, please do not contact us about these funds as we do not have any details yet. First Minister, how many funds have even had guidance issued, never mind delivered money into people's pockets? First Minister. Well, all of the funds, 600 million of the 750 million announced uh, most recently, is already live. The other uh, amount of that, uh, which has been announced more recently, will be going live uh, over the course of the next period. Um, I uh, haven't seen the leaked documents that Ruth Davis refers to. I'm happy to have a look at them and see whether they are up to date or whether they are perhaps uh, out of date. Uh, but since October, we've allocated £750 million to business support. Uh, that includes support of up to £3,000 every four weeks uh, through the Strategic Framework Business Fund. Um, there is additional bespoke funding for sectors like tourism and culture, which have been hit particularly hard, and groups such as uh, self-employed, newly self-employed and taxi drivers. On the 11th of January, just a few days ago, we announced uh, top-up grant support for hospitality, retail and leisure businesses. For larger businesses, that will be a top-up of £25,000, which will be paid, paid later this month. Um, compared to £9,000 in England, for example, smaller businesses will receive uh, a, a smaller amount. Um, and of course, just yesterday, we announced additional funding for our island communities so that they can help businesses that are in level three areas as opposed to level four. I've uh, had discussions with the finance secretary about how we do support councils to get the money out of the door more quickly and into the pockets of businesses more quickly. The digital boost fund that has uh, been mentioned already, it has very quickly been over oversubscribed. So one of the discussions I was just having before I left the office to come here and will continue and complete complete when I get back uh, to the office after this is about how we put additional funding into that in order to meet uh, more of the demand for it. So this is an ongoing process, presiding officer, which we will continue uh, to give the priority it merits. Davison. First Minister responds by listing announcements. I welcome the announcements. Everybody welcomes the announcements. The Scottish Government is great at making the announcements, but this is about getting money delivered into people's pockets, and it's not getting there. The First Minister's inbox will be the same as mine, which is groaning under the weight of people who are desperate to actually see some of the funding that they have been promised to stop their jobs from going under. Here's George. Good afternoon, Ruth. I'm asking as a husband and a father, can you ask the Scottish Government when the grant to Scottish taxi drivers is likely to be distributed. I am on my knees here trying to pay bills and also keep a taxi on the road with little work. It is desperate stuff now. I understand that everyone is in the same position, but we have been promised this since November and we can't find any access to find out what is happening. For George and 38,000 taxi drivers, read thousands more shopkeepers, gym operators, hairdressers, B&B owners, tour operators, wedding operators, self-catering oper operators, and those in any number of supply chains, all of whom have been promised help, they all welcomed your announcements, but all of whom are being told, don't bother applying yet because we don't even know how these schemes are going to run yet. Way back on the 24th of March, Kate Forbes said that the aim was to make payments within 10 working days. Right now, there are sectors out there who would be delighted if they could see promised cash within 10 weeks. When will the First Minister finally get to grips with this, as there are thousands of Scottish jobs relying on it? First Minister. I fully understand how important this is. Ruth Davison uh, seeks to give the impression that no money has flowed to businesses. That is not the case. We have announced many additional uh, streams of support as different sectors have made the case for additional funding. When we announce that, of course, we have to put the arrangements in place, usually through local authorities. Uh, local authorities often ask us for additional guidance about eligibility for that and then the arrangements to get that out. That is an ongoing process that we will continue to accelerate and speed up as much as we possibly can. Uh, there is money flowing to businesses, there will be more money flowing to businesses um, and the Finance Secretary will continue to support uh, councils. Additional administrative support has been given to councils to make sure that the process is as quick as it can be. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, can I thank the uh, First Minister for advance sight of her statement. Nobody welcomes these new restrictions, but compliance with them is necessary. And can I say especially that it really is important 
that employees who can work from home are allowed by their employers to work from home. This week, the Scottish Government's strategy for testing and tracking down positive COVID cases has come under renewed scrutiny. Research by Scottish Labour reveals that in the last four weeks, Scotland has carried out fewer tests per 100,000 than any other nation of the UK. And over the last week, Scotland carried out half the number of tests per 100,000 compared to England. And Professor Mark Woolhouse, a member of the First Minister's own advisory group, has warned, and I quote, we are only finding half or even less than half of the cases. This is like fighting the epidemic with one arm behind our back. First Minister, yesterday you said that you were looking into a rollout of community mass testing at greater scale, which I welcome. But when will this start? Where will this start? And when will Scotland stop fighting the epidemic with one arm behind our back? Um, I've had exchanges of this nature with Richard Leonard before, so I'm happy again to go through some of the basics and also some of the, the work that is underway. The, the figures that Richard Leonard uh, quoted at the outset of his question, uh, and I'm happy to be proven wrong if this is not the case, but I strongly suspect that these are the figures of the demand-led uh, testing scheme. People who have symptoms going to a, a drive-through centre or uh, a mobile testing unit or ordering a home test and getting tested. Now, again, I've, I've, I've set this out before, the reason that the numbers going through that are lower in Scotland than in other parts of the UK is that in Scotland, even although prevalence of the virus is much higher than we want it to be and rising, is lower than it is in other parts of the UK. It's uh, perhaps about three uh, less than uh, a third of, of what it is in some other parts of the UK. So in very simple terms, that means that there are fewer people with symptoms putting the demand uh, on those tests. That's why those figures show what Richard Leonard has, has set out. And I think that's uh, quite an important uh, point of detail to, to grasp and understand. The point about... Uh, asymptomatic testing because that is symptomatic testing so people only go for it if they've got symptoms and if your prevalence means fewer people have symptoms fewer people will be accessing that testing we have uh, we're not just looking at the rollout of asymptomatic testing we carried out pilots in a number of areas uh, before Christmas. Uh, we are in the process of looking at plans from local authorities to roll them out on a bigger scale. We are looking at doing um, and rolling this out very quickly, asymptomatic testing uh, to industrial uh, sites to help with workforce uh, containment as well. Uh, and we'll be setting out details of those plans very, very soon. So that is work in progress. We obviously couldn't do that significantly earlier because a lot of that relies on lateral flow testing technology that has only come on stream in sufficient volumes relatively recently. So all of that is work that is being done at pace. It is important work. And I come back to this point and I don't, I don't want to uh, send any message of complacency about this because I could be standing here next week and it could be very different. But right now, prevalence of the virus, too high, increasing, not acceptable. But it is lower than England, Wales, and it certainly has been lower than Northern Ireland. Um, and that suggests, not that we're getting everything right, that perhaps we're not doing everything wrong, as Richard Leonard often stands up and says. Now, this is something that we never, ever can take our foot off the, the pedal on. We've got to run faster than this virus, and that is what we are determined to continue to try to do. Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you. Well, the First Minister talks about running faster than the, the virus, but the figures are these. Positive case numbers have increased by 184% compared with the start of December, but we are only carrying out 7% more tests. So increasing testing is crucial. But to contain this new wave, we need to be effectively tracing contacts as well. Last time there was a spike in cases, we know that Test and Protect struggled to cope and reverted to using only SMS messages to trace contacts. Back then, the First Minister said her government will, and I quote her, seek to improve the system with more phone calls and fewer people receiving only texts. But according to Public Health Scotland, they say once again, and I quote them, over the past few weeks, contact tracing of contacts has been primarily focused on SMS messages. Is the First Minister satisfied 
that a tracing system based on text messages is sufficient, sufficient to ensure people understand what is required of them and critically how they can access support and how confident is the First Minister that if mass testing is rolled out and cases rise, that the test and protect system will be able to cope. First Minister. Test and protect system is not just coping, it is doing extremely well and that's not a tribute to government, that's a tribute to those across the country who are uh, working really hard to ensure that that is the case and it has coped uh, throughout the pandemic. Yes, at times of higher transmission the pressure on it is greater uh, but it is a, a well functioning uh, system that is coping. It uses uh, for contact tracing a mixture of telephone calls and SMS. The, the priority is to get to uh, contacts as quickly as possible and from the figures uh, that are published on a weekly basis by Public Health Scotland the proportion of contacts uh, successfully traced within uh, the target period of time is high and would show um, certainly the last time I looked at this test and protect in Scotland uh, performing uh, better in many of these metrics than similar systems elsewhere. Now, again, we're not complacent about any of that. We continue to work hard to ensure that the systems in place are commensurate to the scale uh, of the challenge and, and that will continue to be the case. Of course, we also have a, a system uh, whereby uh, local authorities do outreach calls to people, particularly those in vulnerable low-income uh, groups who have been asked to self-isolate to make sure that they uh, understand what is required of them and that they are accessing any support that they need. So this is a system with uh, many different layers to it. We continue to look at how we can strengthen and enhance all of these systems, but you know, I think it is to the great credit of those working in our test and protect system uh, that it continues to operate as well as it does. Richard Lennon. Uh, thanks, President Officer. Well, the First Minister talks about um, uh, people accessing support, but we know that less than a third of applications for self-isolation support grants are approved. This is money that the Government assured the people of Scotland was there to help them in their hour of need. But more than that, this failure is damaging Scotland's efforts to tackle the virus. I know, I know that the Government has revised the support grant scheme. But council leaders that I have spoken to say that the government's criteria are still too restrictive, that they are based on eligibility for particular benefits. As a start, the council leaders suggest widening it out to include those eligible for council tax, re council tax reductions too. Will the First Minister today agree to widen the government's criteria further so that at last the money reaches those people in greatest need. First Minister. Uh, we will always look at uh, reasonable suggestions to modify what we're doing to, to help more people. So, yes, I will uh, undertake to do that. Uh, in terms of the awards being made of the self-isolation support grant, they have uh, increased uh, between October and November, the figures we have available right now. The expenditure on that has increased. We deliberately focused the financial support on the people most likely to face hardship. Um, and uh, we have extended uh, the grant to better reach those it's intended to support since it was launched. Uh, so that includes to parents of children who are required to self-isolate uh, and also to people who are not actually in receipt of universal credit, but whose income is at a level where they might qualify the, for the benefit if they did apply for it. And right now, spending on this support grant is approaching the levels we predicted, which suggests that it is reaching the numbers of people that we thought it, it would. For anybody who is deemed not to be eligible when they apply, local authorities then, if it is appropriate, signpost these people to alternative support that is available, principally uh, through the Scottish Welfare Fund. And of course, we've also increased funding to the Scottish Welfare Fund. So we are seeking to get support to as many people as possible, focused on those most in need. But as with everything else right now, in a situation that continues to be fast moving in terms of the virus, we will continue to look at what more we can do to support people. Thank you. Question three, Willie Rennie. Uh, last week, the Scottish Government said that the PCR tests were safer than the lateral flow tests, but still it does not use the full capacity of that PCR testing to hunt down the virus. The First Minister has just said that demand for that PCR testing is not at the full capacity. So why are we not using that to hunt down the virus in our communities? And if half the people who have the virus don't know they've got it, why isn't the Scottish Government using that capacity 
to find them. That should be the priority for the government. First Minister. OK, um, PCR tests are not safer than lateral flow tests. They are more sensitive and more specific. And I think that's not a pedantic point. That's really important. Um, secondly, PCR testing is uh, the, the route we use for symptomatic testing. Um, and it's important, particularly when transmission is rising, that we ensure the capacity is there to test everybody who comes forward with symptoms. And that uh, is what happened. Turnaround times for testing through that system now um, are, at the moment, I'm touching wood here, extremely uh, good. And uh, we also use PCR testing for uh, some of the routine testing we are doing in care homes uh, for care home staff, for example, and in some groups of NHS staff. The reason for wider mass uh, testing of asymptomatic people, that we think it is better to use lateral flow testing is, and this is apart from uh, the, the sensitivity and how specific they are, this is the other big difference between PCR and lateral flow testing is the speed of results. So uh, with PCR testing, even with the quick turnaround times, it takes time to get the results. Uh, with lateral flow testing, we can give people results much, much quicker. And for people with, uh, who don't have symptoms, that is the preferable way of trying to get that mass testing uh, to people. So we are not, not using capacity. We are seeking to use the different capacities and the different technologies we have in the most effective way to overall uh, collectively uh, keep the virus under control through testing. Testing, of course, important though it is, is only one aspect of the strategy that we have to deploy against it. Will you Rennie? The First Minister has just said she's not, not using all the capacity. What kind of contortion is that? The reality is that there's 65,000 tests available and she's at best only using half of them, just like on business grants, the government is great at making announcements on testing, but very poor on the actual delivery. And when our hospitals are bursting at the seams, we should be using the gold-plated test, the gold standard test, to hunt down the people in our community who've got this virus because they don't know it. That is the best way to stop the spread. Now, I've made positive suggestions for weeks on end in this chamber, and the First Minister has repeatedly poo-pooed them. And still we find out they're not using the capacity that's available. So let me make another positive suggestion today. And I hope the First Minister is able to act on this. Mobile PCR testing units at supermarkets, Royal Mail sorting offices, police stations, schools, to test the people on the front line of the pandemic with the best test that we've got available for them. Will she agree to that? Or is she just going to stick in this rut that she's got herself into? First Minister. Yeah, we've, of course, Scotland's the only country that's currently <laughs> tackling this pandemic. We're not in a rut. We're in the face of a global pandemic uh, that we are uh, seeking to lead the country through. I'm not going to commit to all of that, no, because there are very good reasons why it wouldn't be sensible to do that. The kind of places Richard Leonard talks about are exactly the kind of places we are going to seek to do lateral flow testing uh, through the kind of sites that we piloted before Christmas. With PCR testing, uh, we do use it for routine ongoing uh, asymptomatic testing of certain groups but the reason we would be making a mistake if we tried to use all of our capacity for PCR testing uh, for asymptomatic mass testing is that then it's not available if we see the rates of symptomatic testing requiring uh, that to be used so we have to balance all of the different uh, capacities we have for testing in a sensible way, in the way that other countries uh, do as well. So I know these things are complicated, uh, but there are reasons why the way we do things, while not perfect and uh, absolutely not beyond being improved where that is required, there are uh, reasons why we use testing in the particular ways that we do. Thank you very much. Question for Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As we pass another tragic milestone in the number of deaths from this virus, our thoughts are with everyone who has lost someone close to them. We all need to continue to take this crisis seriously, but instead of debating exactly how long people are allowed to sit on a park bench, we should be supporting people to do the right thing, which they overwhelmingly want to do. For months, the Scottish Greens have been warning that many people simply cannot self-isolate safely. And it's not just because of income, but because of things like physical space, the risk of losing their jobs, caring responsibilities and more. Way back in May, the First Minister seemed to agree with us that we should be providing hotel accommodation for people who need it. 
by November. She couldn't say if that had happened or not. And now we know that most applications for the self-isolation grant are being turned down. Isn't it clear that both the Scottish and UK governments need to take a far more proactive approach to supporting people to self-isolate, as the Greens have proposed and as other countries have already done, if we want this critically important part of our COVID response to be effective? First Minister. Um, I think these points are important. I've already uh, covered some of them in response to Richard Leonard. Uh, we have eligibility criteria for the support grant. Uh, we have already extended those. We will look at extending those further. Uh, where people do not uh, meet those criteria, then they will be signposted to other support. And the outreach service that local authorities uh, do can offer other support. And we will uh, discuss uh, with local authorities whether uh, they feel there is right now um, a, a demand coming through that for things like hotel accommodation. And we can certainly uh, look again, as we did last year, at whether that should become part uh, of the offer we make to people. So we will always look uh, to see what more we can do. Um, while it is really difficult for people in any circumstances to be asked to self-isolate, uh, there uh, certainly is not a suggestion that routinely people are not doing that. People, I think Patrick Harvey is right, are doing the right things. And while that is important, so too uh, is giving people the advice about what they can and can't do through lockdown. I don't think it is right to dismiss that. Certainly my inbox uh, heaves on a daily basis with people wanting that very practical advice. So we've got to support people in all of these different ways, and that's what we'll continue to do. Patrick Harvey. I'm afraid I do still find it frustrating that we're being told this issue will be looked at again. I've lost count of the number of public health experts who've been raising this uh, for months now, as we have, and saying that it needs to be much more proactive. And if we expect cases to remain high and continue to rise with the new variant, this needs to be in place already. The First Minister will also be aware of the pressure on students. They've been told that they shouldn't return to colleges and universities yet. And thanks to Green Amendments to the Coronavirus Act, they have the legal right to cancel unneeded tenancies, but many private housing providers are putting barriers in the way of cancellation or forcing students to pay rent for accommodation they can't use. So does the First Minister agree that students being told not to return to campus should be entitled to a rent waiver for January and February? And what action is the government taking to ensure that landlords respect their right to freely terminate their lease if that's what they decide they need to do. First Minister. Well, let me cover, uh, conclude on self-isolation before going on to the issues of students. When I say we look at things again, we look at these things on an ongoing basis. We have already made changes to the provision of support for people self-isolating. We will never get to a stage in this pandemic where we say we have done enough and we will not look at doing more. So that is a, an ongoing commitment that I think it is important to make. Um, on students, any evidence of private uh, housing providers trying to frustrate the ability of students to exercise their legal rights, we will absolutely look into that and take whatever action is considered necessary. So if Patrick Harvey of, or others have specific instances of that, please pass them to us. Uh, more generally, the uh, issue around rents for students is a matter for universities and for housing providers. I know a number of universities and providers are providing uh, some kind of uh, waiver or rebate, but I would encourage them to go further uh, than that and make sure that the situation students are in is properly uh, understood uh, and properly responded to. And we will, through the Funding Council, continue to discuss with universities the extent to which the Scottish Government can help uh, with that. But fundamentally, these are in the first instance, the responsibilities of universities and uh, the providers of housing to address. Thank you. Question number five, Shuna Robertson. Thank you. Um, to ask the First Minister what the current guidelines are regarding care home visiting. First Minister. Well, in view of the uh, move to enhanced level four measures, it has been recommended that visiting in adult care homes is restricted to essential and outdoor garden and window visits. 
Uh, I know how distressing this is for friends and uh, family of people in care homes, uh, given that before uh, we moved into this situation, again, progress was being made on visiting, but the concerns around the spread of the virus are significant. I hope that with the progress we are making in vaccinating care home residents and staff, we will soon be able to support more indoor visiting. Um, in the meantime, essential and outdoor visiting should continue, and it's vital that care homes uh, support essential visiting to ensure that families are able to visit those who are in distress, who have a change in their well-being, and of course to visit those who are approaching the end of their lives. Chair Robinson. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for that answer and agree that today's vaccination update does give us all hope there's light at the end of the tunnel. With regard to the current guidelines, um, can the First Minister provide further information on how those end-of-life exemption decisions are approached, reached and communicated uh, to families, as I've had constituents who have been notified far too late and have tragically been unable to see loved ones before losing them? And will she consider uh, reviewing the guidance around these decisions in the light of such cases? Uh, yes, if it is thought that uh, reviewing the guidance would help uh, reach uh, appropriate decisions in these cases, of course, we will, will consider doing that. Uh, can I say, first of all, I'm very sorry uh, to hear about uh, your constituents' uh, loss and the loss of anybody um, across the country in, in these circumstances. Uh, we do expect care homes, and I know care homes are working hard on this, to take necessary steps and be flexible in supporting families to visit loved ones near the end of life uh, wherever possible. Essential visits include circumstances where it's clear that the person's health is changing for the worse, uh, where visiting may help with communication difficulties or to ease significant personal stress, um, and that uh, includes approaching end of life. Now, in terms of how these decisions uh, are made, we would hope that care homes and expect that care homes make these decisions in close and regular contact with families. Um, and I think that is particularly important where it is an end of life situation. But we will, of course, continue to reflect on uh, how and to what extent we can uh, make this an easier or a less uh, horrendously difficult process uh, by providing amended guidance. Question six, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the First Minister whether she will provide an update on the rollout of vitamin D supplements for people who are eligible. First Minister. Uh, this week, Food Standards Scotland launched a new campaign to encourage people to take vitamin D supplements to maintain bone and muscle health, and that builds on a recent social media campaign and other work by uh, the Government, Food Standards Scotland and Public Health Scotland to raise awareness of the importance of vitamin D. Um, and of course, that includes the offer we made at the end of last year to everyone on the shielding list of a free four-month supply of daily vitamin D supplements to support their health and well-being over the winter month. Over 71,000 people uh, who opted uh, in uh, received this in early December last year. Uh, supplies were sent out in late November and uh, I understand that this is now complete. Uh, the offer included residents in care homes and those in prisons who will uh, receive their supply through individualised discussions and prescriptions where that is of benefit. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Presiding Officer, vitamin D deficiency is a national issue in Scotland, and we know that 75% of COVID deaths were in the 75 plus age category, and the vitamin D deficiency is higher in this group of people. And lockdown has restricted exposure to daylight, and not all people have access to good food sources. And there is a distinct need to improve immune health in these vulnerable groups. So I'm glad to hear that the First Minister is called um, committed to the calls from campaigners to supply free vitamin D to care home residents. And I also would like to ask if she will consider her government funding vitamin D trials in Scotland to provide resource to gather the data on vitamin D deficiency to sort out the issue that we have with immune health in Scotland. First Minister. Uh, I'm sure uh, there would be a willingness, there is a willingness to consider uh, any proposals for trials. The government funds trials in a whole range of clinical and uh, medical areas and there is a, a, a well-established process for that to be done and uh, I would be very surprised if there hadn't been uh, support for uh, areas around vitamin D in, in the past but yes there, there is a, a process to allow that to happen. I think it is important that we raise awareness of the uh, importance of vitamin D, particularly for people uh, who are more vulnerable to the implications of vitamin D deficiency, which is why the campaigns I've spoken about are so important, particularly given uh, the lockdown situations. Um, and we will continue to look at how we can uh, 
continue to support the availability of vitamin D. The uh, four months uh, free supply for those in the shielding list was important. And uh, what I've said about care homes is also important. The final point I would make here, uh, and I think particularly relevant uh, for people in care homes, is that it is important that the, the provision is based on individual discussions because there can be instances where vitamin D interacts with other medications people are on, so appropriate clinical advice is always vital. Thank you. Question seven, Ruda Grand. To ask the First Minister what analysis the Scottish Government has undertaken regarding whether the level of police enforcement of emergency COVID-19 regulations is appropriate and the impact this is having on compliance with restrictions. First Minister. Well, the Chief Constable has been very clear throughout the pandemic that the police will follow what he describes as the four E's approach, engage, explain, encourage, and then enforce only if that is necessary to protect public health. As part of our ongoing review of regulations, we regularly assess whether the powers given to Police Scotland are proportionate and fair. And in addition, an independent advisory group chaired by John Scott QC and reporting to the Scottish Police Authority provides scrutiny on the police's use of coronavirus powers. Uh, we know that most people and organisations are complying with measures. Polling data throughout the pandemic has also shown high levels of understanding and support for the restrictions, with high levels of self-reported compliance, um, and a high proportion of the public also report uh, believing that the police are doing a good job. Uh, but we continue to review and monitor all of these things very closely. Rhoda Grant. The First Minister will be aware of scenes on social media at the weekend of police enforcement of COVID-19 restrictions. And while she may not be able to comment on the detail, I'm sure she'll agree with me that these scenes are damaging both for public perception and for officers' confidence. Policing by consent underpins the whole ethos of the service and it must be protected. Restrictions are also more effective if the public cooperate rather than they are enforced. Officers are being asked to put themselves into situations that the rest of us are being told to avoid. It's clear that their workload has increased substantially with the new responsibilities and powers they hold. Can I ask what additional resources she's providing to the service to cope with the pandemic? And is she going to ensure that all officers are supplied with body-worn video cameras to provide an accurate account of interactions at this challenging time? First Minister. Well, on resources, we discuss on an ongoing basis with uh, the police the, the resources they require to do the job that we are asking them to do at any given time, and uh, their responsibilities are uh, much greater at the moment for the reasons Rhoda Grant uh, sets out. The uh, use of body-worn uh, cameras is, of course, uh, also a, a matter for the Chief Constable, but that's part of the resourcing uh, discussions that we will continue to have. Um, if Rhoda Grant is referring to the scenes I think she is referring to uh, that many people will have seen in social media, I cannot comment in uh, any detail on those because uh, the matters uh, arising from uh, that video is uh, sub judice uh, and uh, that is the reason why I can't comment but the Chief Constable addressed this particular issue when he joined me uh, at the end of last week at uh, one of the daily media uh, updates and uh, one of the things he said was that the police in that uh, incident were wearing uh, body-worn uh, cameras, so there will be footage uh, of what actually uh, happened there, uh, but obviously that will be for uh, use in any investigations. Uh, the other thing the Chief Constable said, which I want to reiterate and underline, is that I think all of us right now, and, and indeed at any time, but particularly right now, should just exercise a degree of caution in drawing firm conclusions for, from snippets of incidents that we see shared on social media. Uh, often uh, what we see will not necessarily be representative of the reality of the situation. And that's not a specific comment about uh, this uh, case, but it is a more general comment that may or, or may not apply uh, there. But in terms of the police more generally, let me take the opportunity to thank them and the support staff for the work that they're doing and give an assurance that we will continue to work uh, with the Chief Constable and the Police Authority to support them in whatever ways we can. Thank you. We'll move now to open supplementaries. Bob Doris to be followed by Brian Whittle. Bob Doris. Thank you, President Officer. I'm increasingly contacted by both worried staff and customers of large supermarkets. They are concerned some stores have not reintroduced protocols such as queuing 
and limiting store capacity in the same way that they did during last year's lockdown. They're also increasingly concerned a minority of customers simply do not show the same caution when shopping as before. I've been in contact with large supermarkets in my constituency, First Minister, but can I ask First Minister what national guidance and standards exist or could be put in place or indeed strengthened to better and more consistently protect their supermarket workforce in the vital jobs that they do and, of course, the customers? First Minister. Well, food retailers, uh, staff and, of course, customers have a really important role to play in adhering to all of the measures that are in place. In terms of guidance, Food Standards Scotland has published guidance for food business operators that sets out how best to prevent the spread of COVID in the manufacture, processing and uh, retail uh, of food, and that would include uh, supermarket shop floors. And it provides a risk assessment toolkit, which I would, I would encourage strongly all food-related businesses to use. Uh, the main supermarkets have issued stronger messaging uh, just in the last few days about wearing face coverings, and I welcome that, and I want to thank them uh, for all that they're doing to help people keep people safe, but I would also uh, issue a, a strong encouragement to make sure that all of the very stringent measures that were put in place at the first uh, stage of the pandemic in the first lockdown are put in place again and adhered to, um, because that is really important. Obviously, we cannot uh, close down essential retail because people need to access supplies, but it, because these are places that remain open, these are places that pose a risk of the virus spreading. So the operators, uh, retailers have to make sure they've got the right mitigations in place. And of course, I would urge the public to make sure that they abide by all of these when they are going for essential shopping. Brian Whittle to be followed by Sarah Boyard. Hey, thank you, presenting officer. Can I uh, make the First Minister aware of a SPICE investigation on behalf of the Health and Sport Committee, which indicates that some three quarters of people have reduced or significantly reduced their phys physical activity during the COVID-19 crisis. The same proportion also indicate that their mental health, physical health and communities have been negatively affected as a direct result of this uh, decline in their physical activity, which I'm sure the First Minister will agree with me has a significant long-term implications for Scotland's health. I think to revitalise sport and activity post-COVID will require significant planning and resource. So can I ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure that sport and activity is available post-COVID and how will the Scottish Government encourage their restart and participation in these activities? First Minister. Well, we have uh, relatively recently uh, provided support uh, to sporting, uh, different sports and sporting organisations to uh, protect the viability um, of sports clubs uh, during the pandemic. And we are in and will continue to be in ongoing discussion about how they start up uh, their activities again as we come out of this next wave, as we did uh, coming out of the first wave to get many activities restarted again. And, and that is important. I take the opportunity to ask uh, all those uh, who are still able to do elite sport to make sure that they are uh, abiding by all of the restrictions and the spirit of them as well as, as the letter of them. Physical activity more generally, uh, these uh, findings, which I've not seen in detail, but of course they are a concern. Um, in the first lockdown, of course, we, at least for the first part of that, uh, restricted people legally to going outside for physical exercise to once a day. We've not done that this time because I think it is really important that people can get outside, go for walks, cycle, um, runs, whatever uh, they want to do outside. So I would encourage people to, to get outside, to get fresh air, to be physically active. It's good for physical health, and I think we all know it's good for mental health as well. But please, to make sure that the do that for exercise and not uh, to allow that to seep into uh, socialising that then provides opportunities for the virus to spread. But people should be getting outside for exercise uh, for a whole variety of different reasons right now. Sarah Boyack, to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, I spoke to a constituent yesterday who'd found out through the Scottish Government phone app that he'd spent time with somebody who'd been tested positive for COVID. He's worried because it was 10 days before he was notified. So what can be done to make the system more effective, given the perilous situation we're in? Is it the data entry or is it the system not working effectively? First Minister. Um, I, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to cast any light on this uh, right now. I, I'd be very, not just happy, I'd be very keen to look into the circumstances of that. The, the app, of course, is anonymous. It doesn't tell you 
uh, who it is you've been in contact with or, or anything. So I, I'm not immediately clear how it would have been obvious that it was 10 days, uh, but I probably shouldn't try to answer it without knowing and understanding much more of the details. So if Sarah Boyack can pass uh, the, the particulars to me or to the Health Secretary, we will look into that and come back to her as soon as possible. Thank you. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Due to a combination of increased COVID-19 infections, 150 staff self-isolating and a rise in admissions due to winter pressures, hospitals in Ayrshire have been stretched to beyond capacity and, as of last night, NHS Ayrshire and Arne has had to suspend elective surgery. First Minister, will the Scottish Government work with NHS Ayrshire and Arne as a matter of urgency to offer both practical and financial assistance to help alleviate this immediate pressure? to protect and support both patients and NHS staff. First Minister. Uh, yes, we will work closely with all health boards, including Ayrshire and Arran, to ensure that we are supporting them through what is the most challenging times that the health services face probably in our lifetimes. Uh, we are in daily contact with health boards, including Ayrshire and Arran. Uh, in terms of practical and financial support, we've allocated uh, a total of £2.6 million to support elective services uh, up to March. We've also allocated over £700,000 to specifically support this board through the winter period. Uh, and we continue to explore all options to ensure that the most urgent patients are treated. And that, of course, includes those on a cancer pathway. Ayrshire and Arran are specifically sending patients to the Golden Jubilee for cancer breast surgery and diagnostic testing. Uh, we will continue to support all boards to respond to these challenges uh, as well as they can. But can I just finally say we can all support the NHS to cope by staying at home and suppressing this virus. So every single one of us have a part to play in protecting the NHS right now. Edward Mountain to be followed by Neil Findlay. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, I know a lot of joint work has gone into identifying the priority for vaccine delivery. Organ donation, which leads to a transplant, is one of the greatest gifts that can be given and indeed received. I have had constituents contact me who are currently on the transplant list but aren't prioritised for receipt of the COVID vaccine. I believe there's medical and public support for ensuring those awaiting transplants are given the best chance of being COVID-free when they are eventually called in. First Minister, will you ask your advisers to urgently raise with the JCVI whether transport patients should be prioritised for the COVID vaccine? First Minister. Yeah. Um, I certainly will uh, consider this uh, properly, and if uh, that requires us to engage more with the JCVI, we will certainly do that. Firstly, well, I make two points uh, just now. Firstly, I completely agree with the importance of promoting uh, organ donation. It is the greatest uh, gift that anybody uh, can give. When I was Health Secretary, I spent a lot of uh, time working with clinicians and others to uh, raise awareness of and uh, increase the uh, the rates of organ donation. And I know it's something that uh, all health secretaries that have come after me have taken very seriously as well. Um, the second point, though, is, is, is more pertinent to the, the specifics of the question. Uh, the, what are called the clinically extremely vulnerable um, are a priority in the first JCVI list. I think it's priority four uh, in the, the current JCVI list. I, as a, a non-clinician, would expect that many, if not all, uh, transplant patients would be included within that. But if I'm not correct about that, um, I will certainly, that's the point, I will happily discuss with advisors and see whether we need to address that point in any other way. And I'll ask the Health Secretary to write uh, to the member once we've had an opportunity to consider it. Thank you. Neil Findlay, to be followed by Emma Harper. Um, families and members of the par this Parliament have tried for months to make progress on safe care home contact between residents and families, but there has been almost zero progress. Uh, so will the government now bring forward emergency legislation similar to the Ontario model to respect and promote the rights of those receiving care and legislate so identified family or friends can become essential caregivers? Because I believe that if the government did come forward with such legislation, parties in Parliament would work very constructively to make that happen. First Minister. Um, I know the Health Secretary has met with families uh, fairly recently, um, and I believe she's meeting, uh, she has a cross-party meeting next week, so that's something I'm sure she is happy to discuss on a cross-party basis to see whether uh, there is a consensus uh, and a, a feeling that that would be helpful. Progress was been making, being made sorry, in reintroducing safe visiting 
before we got into the second wave requiring these additional restrictions. It is really regrettable that that has had to go back the way, and I made some comments about that earlier on. But given the risk, particularly with the new variant that is posed just now, it is really important that we prioritise the safety as far as we can of people within care homes. It's also why uh, the residents of care homes have been the top priority for vaccination and 80% of them already have had their first dose of the vaccine and hopefully over the next period that will also play a part in allowing us to get back to safe indoor visiting. But legislative options of course we're happy to consider and I'll ask the Health Secretary to ensure that that. Um, President Officer, I'm trying to address a really serious issue uh, very seriously and it's not helpful to be shouted at um, across the chamber. Just to say do it now is, is not helping anybody. It's far better for me to set out the challenges, but also the ways in which we will try to overcome these challenges. What I was about to say before uh, the interruption was that I will specifically ask the Health Secretary, I'm sure she was going to do this anyway, to discuss this in the cross-party meeting that she's having Monday next week uh, to, to look at these options. And if we think this offers a quicker way of getting back to some normality, of course we will do that, but we have to take account of the overall position in trying to keep uh, people in care homes safe. Thankfully, so far in this wave, the number of people dying in care homes is lower, uh, and I'd say that not to try to minimise it in any way, but lower than in the first wave. But we see today from the figures of the death, as I announced earlier on from the NRS report, more than 30% of those are still in care homes. So we have to be extremely cautious in protecting the safety of those residents as far as we can. Thank you. Emma Harper to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Scottish seafood exporters are suffering a catastrophic collapse in their export businesses because of border chaos caused by Brexit. As we know, borders are a matter reserved to Westminster. So can the First Minister detail what assurances and remedial measures the Conservative government is putting in place as a matter of urgency to alleviate these issues which are threatening so many livelihoods across Scotland's coastal communities? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I say the catastrophe that our seafood exporters are facing right now is absolutely shameful and disgraceful. And but for the crisis of COVID that we are living through right now, I am sure this would be dominating uh, the headlines every single day. Um, the issues that are being experienced are a direct result of the UK government's rush to a very substandard finishing line which left exporters less than a week to understand, never mind implement, the implications of the newly agreed relationship with the EU. Uh, the Scottish Government and Scottish Food and Drink stakeholders repeatedly warned that businesses needed more time to effectively prepare for these changes, but the UK Government point blank refused to listen to the request for a six-month grace period. Uh, we are pressing the UK Government to fix this uh, mess. It's a mess entirely of their making. So far, there is no sense of urgency uh, or any suggestion at all that they are uh, prepared to do that. The Rural Economy Secretary has also called uh, for businesses to be compensated for their losses. Uh, the UK Government just appears to be telling businesses to get on with it or face the threat uh, of fines. That is unconscionable and it is unacceptable. We will do everything we can to support our exporters, but the position they are in right now is one they should never, ever have been allowed to be put into. Oliver Mundell to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. If the First Minister has nothing to hide, why won't she explicitly expand the Ministerial Code investigation to cover all of the accusations that have been made against her? There is a big difference between saying that there are no limits on what James Hamilton can look at and explicitly asking him to examine specific possible breaches. First Minister. Well, the Deputy First Minister has actually notified me this morning that Mr Hamilton has written to him confirming that in his views all of the allegations, incidentally all of the allegations I completely refute about breaching the Ministerial Code are covered within the scope of his existing remit. So I said previously that I wanted him to go wherever he thought it appropriate to go and as I understand he has now confirmed that he feels there is no limitation on his ability to do that. So I hope that the member will accept that and now uh, people will allow due processes to take their course rather than making their minds up before we even get to that. Jackie Bailey to be followed by June McAlpine. 
There we go. British Gas, owned by Centrica, have threatened to fire and rehire 2,000 workers in Scotland, placing them on significantly worse terms and conditions, using the pandemic as cover. Many of those workers have been on strike for the past week. They described the changes as having a serious impact on family life and being akin to zero-hour contracts. Given that British Gas operates a number of public sector contracts, including directly for the Scottish Government, what action will the First Minister take to ensure that fair work principles apply to this and all other government contracts? First Minister. Of course, if employment powers rested with this Parliament rather than with Westminster, and if the Labour Party supported that, we'd be in a position perhaps to take uh, tougher action here. Contractual uh, routes are not the way to resolve this. Having control over powers in employment law is the way uh, to do it. I support the workers um, in this uh, regard. I think they are being treated uh, appallingly, and I would call on British Gas to get round the table with them uh, and come to a fair outcome as quickly as possible. Thank you, Joe McAlpine, to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Thank you very much. Uh, the click and collect measures announced by the First Minister today are difficult but necessary. Uh, however, some supermarkets do offer click and collect for food, which is presumably safer, especially if it takes place outdoors. And we know that transmission in supermarkets is quite high. Can the First Minister just clarify that this essential click and collect for food will continue to be allowed? First Minister. Yes, essential uh, purposes for click and collect uh, like that are allowed. And in addition to allowing essential click and collect, and I, I stress essential, uh, as I said earlier on, uh, we are asking that it would be by way of staggered appointment. One of the concerns that has been raised uh, about click and collect is the, uh, the ability for queues to form, so to avoid that and also for it to be outdoors. As far as practical, there will be some circumstances in which it is not uh, practical for that to happen, but normally uh, we would expect uh, any of those services to be de delivered outdoors rather than people having to go into premises. Mike Rumbles, followed by Mark Roskell. Um, <clears throat> has the First Minister seen the letter to her from over 200 church leaders from across Scotland? who question whether in completely closing down churches to public services, it is consistent with their obligations under Article 9 of the European Convention of Human Rights. They are simply asking, simply asking, the Scottish Government would provide them with the evidence that COVID-compliant church services, as were operating safely, were proven to be a significant source of the spread of COVID-19. First Minister. Presiding officer, it has just been brought, drawn to my attention that uh, the Archbishop of Glasgow, Archbishop Tartaglia, has passed away uh, this morning. And I want to put on record my uh, deep sadness at this news. I'm sure that is sadness that will be shared by everybody across this chamber and to send uh, my deepest condolences to uh, his loved ones and, of course, everybody uh, in his community. Um, can I say that that is a serious question that I take uh, very seriously. Uh, I do not want to be imposing restrictions on anybody. I absolutely do not want to be imposing restrictions uh, on people's ability to collectively worship. I know how important that is to people of faith uh, for their uh, well-being, uh, mental health and of course for uh, the, the purposes of, of their faith. Um, so we don't take any of these decisions lightly. This is a pandemic where, at the stage we're at right now, we simply must stop, as far as we can, people coming together. And that includes, unfortunately, in places of worship. These restrictions will not be in place for any longer than is absolutely necessary. I have had uh, representations made to me by church leaders, by uh, members of different churches, saying that they want to see that uh, rethought. Um, but I've also, I have to say, had representations from uh, others in churches saying that they understand and think that in all the circumstances, these restrictions are appropriate and necessary. So these are difficult decisions. And this is perhaps one of the most difficult. But the more we act collectively to suppress this virus, the quicker we get out of these restrictions and get back to a degree of normality, including allowing people to take part in collective worship. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Christine Graham. Thanks. There are now over 80,000 people in Scotland on the shielding list due to the burden of lung disease. So can the First Minister make a commitment to speed up the delivery and funding of the Respiratory Care Action Plan so that we can get better recovery from lung disease while building resilience against COVID? 
First Minister. I am not aware of any um, issue with the uh, speed of the funding or the actions there, but I'm happy to look into that and ask the Health Secretary to engage with the member uh, about further actions that we may be able to take. And Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, earlier, the Deputy First Minister said in questions on education um, regarding Category 3 key workers, that is, those essential to economy, that there will be differences in different geographical areas, which I understand. However, I have cases where some employers are telling employees they are key workers to come into work and therefore to apply to the council for face-to-face um, -face teaching for their children, which is, in my view, correctly rejected by the council and by the local authority. It does seem to me that some employers are not acting within the law, let alone within the spirit of the law. And I'm therefore asking if Category 3 of, quotes, essential to the economy could be beefed up. First Minister. Well, Christian Games write that, uh, well, firstly, key worker childcare guidance was published last week. It is intended to provide uh, guidance, obviously, that's what it is, but to also provide some flexibility for councils to respond to local needs. In summary, category one is health and care workers supporting COVID, emergency and critical care, uh, staff supporting childcare and learning, and priority energy supply workers, category Two includes other health and care staff, public sector workers providing emergency or critical services and essential uh, critical national infrastructure staff. And finally, category three is people without whom there could be significant impact on uh, the country. Authorities must consider local needs when applying these definitions, including prioritisation where there might be high demand. Um, but I would say to all employers, to act in a way that doesn't generate unnecessary demand on places uh, in schools because we have to look very carefully as we go through this next phase at the numbers in schools to make an assessment on an ongoing basis about whether it is getting too high uh, to a point where it is undermining the whole point of schools not being open at the moment. So employers have a big part to play in that and I would ask them uh, to do that. And employ employees should discuss any request for a place uh, with their employer before contacting their local council. And of course, as with everything, we will keep these categories under review. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. Uh, our next item of business is consideration of business motion 23849 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. Could I call on the Minister to move this motion? Move, President Officer. Thank you very much. No member has indicated the wish to speak on this motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 23849 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the next item is consideration of business motion 23850, also in the name of Graeme Day, on behalf of the Bureau, setting out a stage two timetable. Could I call on the Minister to move this motion? Move, President Officer. Thank you very much. And again, no members asked to speak in the motion. The question is that motion 23850 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, oh, so the next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 23853 on committee meeting times. Could I call on Graeme Day, on behalf of the Bureau, to move this motion? Move, President Officer. Thank you very much. So just this one question. The question is that motion 23853 in the name of Graham Day on committee meeting times be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time. That concludes today's business and I suspend this meeting. Thank you.